Uh, I invite you to reach for a Bible and open up to Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 15. Now, we uh, looked, we're looking over the last entire year, all of 2018, almost, you know, most of the Sundays, we've been studying the Gospel of Matthew, and we kind of resume that uh, today, and um, I'm going to be reading verses 32 and following of Matthew's gospel. For we read this, And Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the multitude, because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not wish to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, Where would we get so many loaves in a desolate place to satisfy such a great multitude? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven and a few small fish. And he directed the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fish and giving thanks, he broke them and started giving them to the disciples. And the disciples in turn to the multitudes. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, seven large baskets full. And those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And sending away the multitudes, he got into the boat and came to the region of Magadan. Now some of you who have been here over the last year and have been here through the fall may be thinking, it sounds to me like pastor's getting a little bit lazy here. And he thinks that we don't remember that he preached on this miracle back before he paused for his kind of series of Christmas sermons. He's trying to slip a rerun rerun in on us here. And uh, we caught him on that, right? Because I know that he preached on the miraculous feeding where Jesus took the bread and the fish and multiplied them. I know he did. And you're right. But that was in Matthew chapter 14. This, what we're reading about, is in Matthew chapter 15. So maybe it's the Apostle Matthew who's a little lazy, right? And decided to take some time off. No, maybe Matthew's forgetful. Or could it be that Matthew is thinking, that miracle was just so powerful, how do you only put it in the gospel once? And so he shares it again. Well, let's take a look at the miracle that we just read about and see the similarity with chapter 14, right? In verse 32, we saw that there's crowds that are with Jesus. They've been listening. Time passes. They're getting hungry. And they have a problem. In verse 33, we read that what? We... Get so many, little Elmer Fudd here I'm coming out of me. We weed, I don't know. But where, were, where would we get so many loaves in such a desolate place? You look back in chapter 14, and in chapter 14, there in verse 15, we read, and when it was evening, the disciples came to him saying, the place is desolate. What we know in both situations there aren't no Wawa's nearby, right? This, this is, they're in the middle of a place where they can't find some quick food. It's the same thing, right? In verse 34 of Matthew 15, they have some loaves and some fish. Same thing back in chapter 14 and verse 17. In verse 35, Jesus tells them all to sit down. Same thing that happened back in Chapter 14 and verse 19. In verse 36, we read that he took the loaves and the fish. He gives thanks. He breaks them. And an incredible miracle takes place. And the bread continues to multiply. And it feeds over thousands of people. See, in one sense, if you were here for that story in Matthew 14, and you're here for this one, you're saying, hang on a second. This is the same supper. This is, this is the same event. And in one sense, it is. In one sense. In that it's the same thing happening. Why? 
Well, certainly one of the reasons why we would know why Jesus would do this is because they, like we, need to be reminded. Because we are people who forget what God has done for us and how much we need him. I'm somebody who would say, oh man, if I was standing there by the Red Sea and God opened up the Red Sea in front of us and we all got to go through like the people of Israel did in Exodus and then the, all the Red Sea closed on the Egyptian army, I would never doubt God again. But they did. And so do we. We forget. We forget how much we need him. And there are some who think this is the same miracle. Not only because of the similarities, but because in their mind they're like, how could it possibly be a genuine statement in verse 33 that they got all these people that need to be fed and the disciples say, where would we be able to get so much bread to feed them? At Christmas, Christmas Day, Greta and I had the joy of having our children and their spouses there around the table, right? And it was Vince and his wife Katrina and Deanna and her husband Nate and Natalie was there and Greta and I. And imagine if we're sitting there enjoying it and I said, boy, this week I've got, I, 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 have, an, I have something happen at church where I got to find somebody who can play the guitar. Where am I going to find somebody who could play the guitar, right? Well, th those of you who don't know, uh, that was Nate, my son-in-law up here who was playing guitar. Uh, he's a, a tremendously uh, gifted guitar player. And uh, obviously, it would be one of those, G Dad, where are you going to find a guitar player, right? <laughs> Philadelphia Eagles were moving along this year and Got to a point where they're six and seven, and Carson Wentz is having a good year, and but you know he was also missing some. It wasn't quite looking the same, although. But we find out he's got a fracture in his back. Uh, the season looks lost, and he's going to have to be benched because of his injury. And Eagles fans everywhere said. Where could we possibly find a backup quarterback who's won some big games in the NFL? If only jolly old St. Nicholas lean your arm this way, right? Whew. How I look forward to rejoicing in a second Super Bowl in a few weeks. But we, we look at it, are the disciples going... Gee, I don't know how we're going to feed these people. I think on one hand, and we're going to see in a moment a, a, another factor, but on the one hand, it's a repeat miracle. Why? Because it is possible that they're literally like us. We forget about the fact that we were saying to the Lord before, if you just get me out of this jam, I'll never doubt you again. But that was a year ago. And now it's, where are you, God? Do you even exist? Right? We, that we are repeat offenders. And we need a repeat miracle sometimes from God. Jesus displays that repeat miracle. And in one sense, it's the same meal. But there's something very, very different about this meal. Fifty years ago, I was in second grade, going to school right across the street there. Uh, and I don't remember a specific night, but I remember one of many nights because it happened, you know, you know, somewhat frequently, you know, where my mother might say to us as we're going off to school as children in elementary school, don't ruin your appetite because I'm making pasty for dinner tonight. Well, pasty is little cubes of steak and slices of potatoes and a layer of steak, a layer of potatoes, you know, with a bottom crust, a top crust. It's a meat pie, some salt and pepper. But, oh, whew, man, it was one of my favorites, right? I loved when my mother would make pasty. Fifty years later, Greta made pasty 
for me this week. Not the first. She's been making it for the last 30 years for me, right? But what I mean is this week she made it. It's the same meal. I'm not comparing my mom's cooking and my wife's cooking. My point is it's, it's the same meal. But there's something very different. When I was a kid, my mom put two pies on the table and there were eight of us to eat them. This week, Greta made me one all for myself. <laughs> it was gone in 24 hours. I, 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 I can tell you that. Oh, that's the goodness, right? It was different. Same meal, but it's different. We look at this and we look at some details and we know it's a different miracle. Some because of those details. In chapter 14, they had five loaves. In chapter 17, 15, they have seven loaves. In chapter 14, there were 12 baskets left over. In chapter 15, there's seven baskets left over. In chapter 14, 5,000 men were, were fed. In chapter 15, 4,000. Is it just that they, Matthew didn't check his figures? He didn't t t look back and go, what did I say before? No, there's some differences. But the most significant difference is one that we just would not pick up right away. I got a notification from Facebook this week. The notification said to me, we believe that there may be some people who have posted your picture on Facebook. You may want to check these. How did they do that? Because Facebook uses facial recognition software. And if they have a picture of your face, they have software that has that in its data. And when a picture comes up, they're constantly getting scanned. They, and they were right. I looked at the pictures and it was people, I, I did that person's wedding. And I mean, I'm literally just standing there almost to the side. It's a, pictures on them. But Facebook recognized my face back there. And obviously, the United States government has your face probably in their data bank somewhere. And uh, if they're looking for you in a crowd, they may find you, right? Because of that facial recognition software. Well, we don't have that here in the Bible. There's no photos. But if it did, what we would realize is facial recognition software isn't going to help us a lot here. Because most of the faces in the crowd in chapter 14 are not in the crowd in chapter 15. Yeah, the disciples and some of the followers of Jesus, but this is a very different crowd. The first crowd was a Jewish crowd. This crowd is mostly a Gentile crowd. Charles Erdman, Erdman says this, It is this fact of a ministry among Gentiles which forms the distinguishing feature of the great miracle which Jesus now proceeds to perform. See, Jesus has been traveling up into the Gentile lands and the crowds that follow him this time are different than the ones who had followed him at the other feeding Tasker in his commentary says, Matthew makes clear the fact that Jesus was now in predominantly non-Jewish territory as seen by his statement that the crowds glorified the God of Israel. You see there in verse 31 when it's talking about what Jesus is doing and they glorified the God of Israel. That's a reference to how the Gentiles respond to the God of Israel. Alfred Edersheim says, there can be little doubt that this second feeding of the multitude took place in the Gentile Decapolis, and that those who sat down to the meal were chiefly inhabitants of that district. The most noteworthy difference between the two meals is that on the first occasion, they who were fed were Jews. On this occasion, they who were fed are mostly Gentiles. Why is that so significant? Because if you know anything about that land at that time in history, you would know there was tremendous hostility. There was tremendous prejudice between the Jews and the Gentiles. There was antagonism. There was a looking down on them. There was, for, for, for many a Jew, if they needed to get from here to there, and the GPS said, take this road... 
but it was going through Gentile villages. No, we'll take the alternate hour and a half route behind that. You know, we're going around because that's the way they felt. If you are familiar with the story in John chapter 4 when Jesus goes and he speaks to the Samaritan woman. And the Samaritans were only partly Gentile. They were part Gentile and part Jew and descendants of that. And when she is, when Jesus meets with her in John chapter 4 and Jesus asks her to give a drink to him, we read in verse 9, the Samaritan woman therefore said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Hostility. Prejudice. And earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, as we were reading it through, we know that when Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, came, and we know clearly with no prejudice, with no hostility toward the Gentiles. But when he came, how did he direct for his ministry to begin? In Matthew chapter 10, we, if you remember back then when we went over this, in verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out. He gets his disciples together and he instructs them saying, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles. And do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When Jesus began, he said, don't go to the Gentiles. Now, he knew it was because his plan was initially to reach all people, but he was beginning with the Jews. For them as disciples, that makes sense. The Gentiles don't deserve the message that we deserve as the people of Israel. And we're going to the Jews with the gospel message. And so back in chapter 14, when Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, multiplies bread for thousands of Jewish people, for the apostles, that makes sense. Just like Moses was used of God to feed the people of Israel in the wilderness, you know, God provided manna from heaven. Here it is that Jesus, the true Savior, has come to be used of God to provide the bread for the people of Israel. It makes sense to them. But this is different. This gathering is not the people of Israel, this is a different crowd. And we can perceive almost, I, I, I don't want to be unfair to them, but a hint of how they viewed this crowd different than the other crowd, right? In the fact that in chapter 14 and verse 15, what do we read there? In chapter 14 and verse 15, we read, And when it was evening, the disciples came to him, saying, The place is desolate. And the time is already past, so send the multitudes away that they may go into the village and buy food for themselves. In chapter 14, the disciples are looking at all of these Jewish people and saying, Jesus, we got to care for them. They're hungry. They, they need food. They're our people. In chapter 15, the disciples come to Jesus and say, Lord, these people. No, they don't. We don't read of any concern on the disciples' part for this crowd. It's Jesus who brings it up to the disciples, right? Much like in John 13, when he waits until none of them wash each other's feet, that he then does, right? It's Jesus here, perhaps Jesus looking and saying, you know, I, when, when is one of my disciples going to come up to me with a concern for this crowd? But they don't. And we read in verse 32, And Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the multitude, because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. I do not wish to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. As a matter of fact, when we look at verse 33 again, perhaps we have a little more understanding because many commentators see in there evidence 
that the apostles, in essence, are saying, where are we going to get food to feed them? Oh, we remember that you performed a miracle to provide food for your people. But we're not connecting that with this crowd at all. Because these are the Gentiles. Why would we expect that they get the same treatment that the people of Israel would get? Why? Because that's exactly what Jesus has in mind. Jesus displays the same supper, but he's saying to his disciples, it's a new now. I'm doing something new. I always knew I was going to do it, but it's a new turn in the ministry. One of my favorite verses in the book of Revelation, when we have a vision, John is given a vision of eternal life with the Lord. Jesus says what? I'm making all things new. He is always doing new things in lives. Jesus, even for eternity, we are going to be celebrating newness. Somehow with God, our eternity in heaven is never going to grow old and boring. I make all things new. And Jesus is making that clear here to his disciples. It's the same supper, but it's a new now. That's our God. He'll eventually say to his disciples, look, get out of Jerusalem and Judea and go unto Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Take the message forward. In Acts chapter 10, God is going to make it crystal clear to Peter. Peter, this gospel, that wall that you see between Jews and Gentiles, I've shattered it. The gospel is freely given to all. Oh, what a truth for us that there is no wall that Jesus can't shatter. Whether it's ethnic or economic or educational, there is no wall. We go forward with the beauty of the fact that Jesus Christ wants to do new things in lives no matter who we are or where we've come from. It's a new day. God says to Peter, it's a new day. Because Jesus brings his power to create newness. And that's really what I wanted to emphasize. I stopped intentionally at, before Christmas, before this passage, because as we're looking at a new year in front of us, we need to stop and remember and soberly take to heart that there are some people who thought they were going to see the year 2019, and they're not on the earth anymore. They thought they were going to be, though. I did plenty of funerals this past year of people who were younger than me. You're here. God has allowed you to see 2019. And there's a reason why. Because Jesus wants to do a new now in you this year. He brings the power to create a new now for us. It's what he always does. He's always doing something new. And maybe for you today, that's to become a new child of God. In John chapter 3, as Jesus is talking, Nicodemus is saying, how can I know for sure I'm going to heaven? And Jesus says, you must be born again. What does that term mean? I don't like the born again term. There's people I know are born again. I, you know. What does that mean? Well, we saw little ones up on the stage here, right? We saw Jack and Johnny and Annie, and we all know that which is born of the flesh is flesh. They, they have had their fleshly birth. But Jesus says there's another birth. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't be surprised that I tell you, unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. You need to have a new birth through faith in Christ. The apostle Paul says to the Corinthians, if anyone's in Christ, they become a new creature. Old things are passed away. Everything becomes new. 
In John's gospel, John says, Jesus came into his own and his own didn't receive him. But whoever receives him, to them he gives the power to become the children of God. Maybe, maybe that's why God's allowed you into 2019 because he wants to create a new now in you today that today is the day that you come to faith in Christ and say, I am claiming my new now. I want to live the rest of my days on this earth as a child of Almighty God. Oh God, I put all my faith in Jesus. I trust that he paid for my sins on the cross he rose from the dead in victory. I claim a new now, today, as a child of God. It's between you and the Lord. I, 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 it's the greatest new now you'll ever experience. Maybe you've already done that. But you need to be reminded that First John tells us what? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And there is some sin that you have been living in and you ended 2018 in it and you began 2019 in it. And you know it's eating away at you. And you're hiding and you're doing all you can to deceive others and cover it up. God says, confess it. I want to bring a new now into your life right now. I want to literally, in this moment, cleanse you of that sin. I want your new now to be that you walk out of here saying, I am forgiven and clean. The writer to the Hebrews says, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses around us, let us lay aside the weight that holds us back. Right? Cast it aside. Run the race before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. What, what is the weight that's got you? Uh, you know, I, I, it, what, is it fear that's holding you back? Is it doubt? Is it, what is it that has you? Jesus brings the power right now. And I believe he's talking to some of you. Not me, he is, to your hearts. I want to create a new now for you. I want to set you free and have you journey forward free of that weight. Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says, do everything without grumbling and complaining. In chapter 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. I've learned to be content. To the Thessalonians, he says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. Maybe you have been living different than those verses. And the new now for you is that God wants to cause you to stop focusing on the negative. Stop being a victim of the burdens. Stop living under a cloud of discontentment. Take a new journey. Jesus is giving you a new now to take a journey that's filled with cheerful gratitude. I'm going to thank God for so many things. A new journey that's filled with confident hope. Lord, I'm going to forget about my negativity of the past. Sure, there's trouble ahead. Sure, there's difficulty. But it's a new now in my life. I'm going to go forward with gratitude and with confidence in you. John chapter 13, Jesus says... I'm going to wash your feet. And he washes the disciples' feet. And when he's done, he says, I just gave you an example for you to go and do to one another. And he finishes by saying, love one another as I have loved you. Maybe you ended 2018 keeping score as a husband, as a wife, as a parent, as a child, as a friend, as a neighbor. You've been... Very focused on how are you being loved? How are you being served? It's not a joyful way to live. Jesus right now says, I'm ready to do something new. I am bringing a new now into your life. It's a new day for you to say, I am going to pursue the joy of intentional love. I'm going to pursue the joy of intentionally being the one who serves. See, I, I, I look at this passage 
And I'm reminded that a new now is available to me. But it's not in my own power. It's with my life in the hands of the Savior who took bread and multiplied it. And in his power, he fed 5,000. And in his power, he fed 4,000. It's that power that wants to bring a newness in my life. In the hands of the one who took bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This is the new covenant. That's our God. Let's bow before him as we're about to partake of this communion in front of us. Dear friend, I don't know if any of the items that I mentioned applied to you, but I want to encourage you to not, to not move away from this moment without saying, Lord God, whatever you're new now is for me. I humbly bow before you and I want to embrace it. Maybe in your own heart, quietly just saying, Lord God, I put all my trust in Jesus. I believe he multiplied the bread miraculously because he is the Son of God. I believe that he is the bread of life. I put all my faith in him. Give me new life today. Maybe before we share this communion, you want to say, Lord God, give me a new cleansing. Give me a new faith. Give me a new desire to love others as you have loved me. Lord, we thank you for this communion that we're about to share we ask that we would be so consumed that we have a God who makes all things new. In your name we pray. Amen.